Yeah, my shadow is not really in it. I'm Mike Hideous. I'm from a band called The Empire Hideous. So you want like you want a history of the band, so to speak? Yes. I started Empire Hideous in uh, around 1988, and um, I went through about 10 years of uh, doing hard gothic rock, dark music, and um, uh, eventually, after years, I. I joined up with the Misfits in 98. Um, I also did another project called uh, the Bronx Casket Company in 99 and currently. And I also started another band in 99 uh, called Spy Society 99. Um, all four bands were very, very different from each other. Empire Hideous was the dark, heavy, gothic rock. The Misfits were, you know, legendary punk band. <coughs> and. Um, the Bronx Casket Company is more of a typo negative Black Sabbath sounding type. Balls to your mother. <laughs> okay, wait, I'm going to give you the old nod. Okay. Uh, I started Empire Hideous back in 1988. Um, uh, just basically, I had no idea what I was doing. I started writing music uh, with a friend of mine, and eventually, before I knew it, band picked up, and we were doing club shows and recording records and CDs and tapes and doing videos and all that. And um, it went on for 10 years uh, until 98. Um, you know, and in between we had a real successful uh, turnaround with, with uh, our, our fan base, uh, New York, New Jersey, Philly area. And um, people really picked up on it and, you know, it was, it was good for what it was. And, I'm happy for the things that we did, although I wish we had a, a better budget where I could have recorded um, more quality uh, recordings and final projects. Uh, it was it was something that I really never had. I never had the financial backing by any record label. It was always, you know, DIY, um, which, you know, and I, still, I still did it, though. Um, Despite the fact that I never had any financial backing or a record label uh, back me up, I did everything from booking the shows, writing the songs, uh, printing the t-shirts, printing the stickers, printing out f pamphlets for shows, uh, promoting, passing out flyers. I did it all. And uh, unfortunately, the, the band had come to its demise in, in 98 um, for some internal, personal band member problems. and. Um, it disbanded. Good. I got into the Misfits in 98. Um, after Empire Hideous had broken up, I, uh, I got a call from Jerry Only, the bass player, and uh, we had known each other for a good 10, 10 11 years before that very moment and um, he asked me if I wanted to go on tour with him and I had nothing going on so I said yes uh, as uh, any anybody would have uh, I'm sure um, and uh, before I knew it you know I was on a plane to Scotland and uh, we toured all of Europe pretty much most of Europe um, and then we came back for a couple weeks hit South America and um, you know, it was a really good run. Uh, it was very good learning experience, uh, as well as a career, ex uh, an exposure for my career as a musician. Um, and uh, you know, it's unfortunate that the things that happened did. Uh, I wish I could have changed a lot of it, but unfortunately, you know, what's done is done. And um, it, we just had a very bad breakup. Uh, I was. I was left high and dry, basically. Uh, um, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you from my side of the story, but there's a lot of things that are being said, uh, rumors that are going around, being said that um, aren't exactly what really happened, um, uh, which is why I wrote a book about it. But 
Yeah, it broke up really bad in 90, uh, well, 98. I was only in there for a few months, uh, you know, four or five months. And unfortunately, it just, I was left high and dry, like I said. And that was the end of that. I, um, after I got out of the Misfits, I, I had an idea, uh, I had a brainstorm of what kind of band I wanted to form next. Um, and basically, I, it, it was a rock and roll uh, with a with a an idea uh, concept to it all. Um, and that was uh, I had uh, I, I saw a lot of the the, the spy themes coming about and uh, I had always been into James Bond movies and um, you know the such uh, so I decided to start a band called Spy Society 99 also known as SS 99 and um, the concept was we, we all dressed up in suits and ties uh, you know black suits white shirts black ties pulled our hair back wore these big black glasses and um, the songs were very, uh, they were very uh, upbeat tempo, very ear friendly, radio friendly, and um, uh, I just, I thought it was a great idea, I really did. Um, everything was like, you know, upbeat tempo, and uh, unfortunately no, none of the record labels picked up on it, I don't know why, but uh, we played a bunch of shows, we recorded an album, although we never released it to the public. Um, it, there was a four song demo that was available but we didn't mass produce it but there was a full length album called Die Punk Die uh, we never we never released it though uh, again all the music was upbeat tempo and the songs were about like, I never really lost my edge in writing lyrics um, I didn't sell out so to speak I still st I, I stayed very dark and wrote about like killing your girlfriend and uh um, you know, the overthrow of the government and, you know, SS USA, uh, you know, it was just like a really fun, fun project. I loved the band. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was a great concept. Fortunately, I don't think anybody else did. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'll never really know for sure. We had to put it on the back burner because that's um, around, the sa around the end of the Spy Society uh, uh, circle. Uh, a new circle began, and that was the rejuvenation of Empire Hideous again, with a whole new lineup. Um, and as we started getting busy with Empire Hideous, uh, SS99 was put on the back burner, and then eventually just completely taken off the back burner and put on the shelf for good, because we just didn't know if uh, we'd ever do it again. It was just too busy. Empire Hideous started picking up again, so I put SS99 on the shelf. Um, after Hideous had broken up, uh, hang on a second, <laughs> all right, do you mind? Um, after Empire Hideous broke, broke up, I had, there was a time frame where between Empire Hideous and the Misfits, uh, I had gotten a call from D.D. Verney, who's in a band called Overkill. And he had actually, uh, no, that's wrong. I actually got a call from his guitar player, Jack Frost, who was in this side project with Dee Dee uh, called the Bronx Casket Company. Jack called me up, said, uh, Dee Dee is interested in having you sing um, for this project called the Bronx Casket Company. Um, and it sounded intriguing. They let me hear a, a demo that, that Dee Dee had, had played. And um, I, I I said, you know, what the hell? It was a paying gig. I, I, I knew Overkill. I knew Dee Dee. I knew who he was. And um, it was just something that I thought I'd take on. When I started recording the music, I was really taken by it. And it, it's very powerful, uh, very powerful type of music. Um, I, you know, recorded the album, the, the first album with uh, the band. And... Um, I figured, you know, this is this is a pretty good outlet. It's different, you know, and 
actually before that even happened is you know the the misfit thing happened and then i came out of the misfits and then we did the first album um at the same time spy society was going on uh so it, it's it's a cross between the, the three bands that they just uh the three bands just kind of merged to like not merged but the 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 creation and the the happenings of all of them just meshed into like at one point in time between 98 and 99 you know and you have to stop now <laughs> this is fucking cat you gotta <laughs> chill the fuck out I'm barreling okay the Bronx Casket Company was a project that I got into after the Misfits and I had gotten a call um, actually prior to the Misfits I got a call from Jack this guy Jack um, who asked me to sing for this side project that Dee Dee Verney was doing from Overkill. Uh, and it was called the Bronx Casket Company. And unfortunately, you know, I, I got hooked up with the Misfits and that was the end of that. But when I came out of the Misfits is when they continued to ask me to sing for this record that they were going to do. And uh, it was going to, you know, they were going to get a record deal and all this jazz. And I figured, all right, what the hell, you know, and I... I I hooked up with with uh, Dee Dee and Jack, and um, I did this recording for this rec this album, full length album, and um, you know it was very different, very metal, very typo negative, very Black Sabbath sounding, and um, but I did it nonetheless because I found it to be very, um, very, a very powerful type of music, um, and I wanted a, a new outlet, you know. Um, at the same time, when I started with the Bronx casket company spy society was going on and it's like all three bands were just sort of uh, just kind of all tumbled together at the same time they, they were it's like a start start finish start finish like between all three of them you know and um, uh, needless to say we did a uh, we did two albums with the Bronx casket company uh, both of which are on massacre records uh, in Germany and uh, yeah, that's about it. We sold 15,000 copies on the first record. I think we're up to about 20,000 copies for the, for the second album. Which, uh, the first album is self-titled. The second album is, um, it's called, um, uh, Sweet Home Transylvania. And, uh, I don't know, it's still up in the air whether we're going to do something else or not. I'm not sure. I wouldn't mind. We were supposed to play some shows this year, but... With everybody being in another band, it's sort of hard. The, on my re on my album, "Victim Destroys the Sailing," that the comparison between the apocalypse and the end of the world, and uh, how America. Like I'm a big Nostradamus fan. Who is it? What's that? <laughs> Who is it? Who is it? Yeah. Um. Whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Uh, Empire Hideous has been, it's, it's been quoted as being um, an apocalyptic band. Uh, the music that I've written about over the years and the lyrics that I write always have to do with the end of the world or the coming of the end of the world or Nostradamus' predictions and prophecies. Um, and just recently, about a little over a year ago, a person had contacted me. And it was uh, not long after the 9-11 tragedy had taken place. And this person contacted me and said, you know, I listened to your songs uh, Vic from the Victim Destroys Assailant album, uh, which was the last Empire Hideous album I put out. And he said to me, the meaning that I get, the, the definition from your music uh, on where we are right now in, in this time frame, he said it was so accurate uh, in describing how America would take a hit uh, eventually, and we would face the um, you know, we'd face war and the apocalypse possibly, and uh, that's always what I had I had always written about that, you know.
He does. Um, yeah, the the predictions of Nostradamus were always. Um, I was always fascinated by that, and I, I used to write a lot about what what would happen if the world were to come to an end, or or America would uh, be attacked. And, Basically, that's what happened in 9/11, and a lot of my my writing um, and music was um, it was just about you know how the world would end and how we would we would suffer, and I think we're already there. Uh, needless to say, getting back to my friend who had mentioned uh, uh, the empire hideous defining this this hit on America, um, he also said to me, uh, you know. There's no better time than the present than to come back. I mean, you guys had foreseen uh, New York City being attacked, and that's that's exactly what I saw. I think I'm rambling on at this point, but mainly uh, he he said that it was it was something that it was a prophecy that I had written through music. Uh, the song Talk is Cheap, which is the first track on Victim Destroys Assailant. Um, it's a song that I wrote in the mid-90s uh, about a group of people that I found to be um, just not true to what they made themselves out to look like or, or to be. Um, but you know, it's funny, when people ask me what the meaning of one of my songs are, I can't necessarily give them an accurate description, because if it's the way that I write that gives the reader and the listener the opportunity to make up their, not always, but make up their own definition um, of what the song means, and, and get their own interpretation uh, of what, what the song is. So talk is cheap could be about anything. It could be about anything that really doesn't sh like shed light or truth on something. Um, in my case, it was something or a group of people who I just found to be completely fake, and everything that they said was uh, it just didn't. They never had any balls to back it up. And um, that's talk is cheap. Yeah. MTV. 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 I, I don't get MTV anymore. I, I don't understand it. I, it's, uh... Someone recently told me how they met the president, uh, the entrepreneur, whatever he is, of MTV. It's like some preppy guy who, uh, I guess his main goal is to make money. I can't really necessarily... I'm not blaming the guy for anything, but... I just don't understand MTV anymore. I think, I think they should change the name. It's not, uh, it's not a music video station anymore. It's primarily all this rap, um, rap, new metal rap crap. It's bunch of, it's a bunch of crap. Is what it is. It's just, I can't stand watching MTV. I think it's a, it's, a, it's annoying. It's annoying to see all the talk shows, all the real, real world um, TV shows. Um, it's uh, I don't know. I, I think I, every time I turn it on, there's some video. On, not even a video. It's a talk show. But uh, when I do see a video, it's 90% of the time it's rap. And I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I, I hate rap. I I don't like rap at all. Um, but it seems to be the in thing right now. Yeah, it's just my opinion, but I think rap lost its balls. Uh, it doesn't really have a meaning anymore. Years ago, in the late '80s, rap was it, it had uh, something to say. It had um, it had a message for the black community. Now, you can't tell me that Eminem has a message for the black community. Or Kid Rock has a message for the black community, and they're doing rap, and that's all this popular music. I don't get it. 
I'm completely confused. And yet all these guys are making millions of dollars, and me, I'm piss broke. I don't get it. I, I really don't understand what, what rap is all about right now. Maybe I'm just ignorant to it all, what, you know, it's all going on. But MTV glorified it, you know, all these rap bands are out. Rap bands, they're not even bands, they're just a bunch of guys who get up behind a microphone and, like, speak. They don't even sing. It, it's How could it be a band? The definition of a band is a unit of men or women together playing instruments, creating music. Now, you know, I try to be cultural uh, in, in in a lot of different things. And I'll, as soon as I see, if I flip through the channels and I see a rap thing going on, I'll watch it and I'll try to figure out what's going on. And, you know, appreciate it for what it is. But the fact of the matter is, uh, what does it take to do rap music? It doesn't really take much of anything, quite frankly. It... Uh, you know, I could do rap. I could do rap music with two arms and my legs tied behind my back. It, it's so simple. It's so simple. It is such a sellout at this point. You know that I don't even. I, I wonder if, like, even the black community and you know those involved in uh, in rap music even understand what's happened. It's in commercials. I mean, Jesus Christ, Pop Tarts uses it rap in their commercials. Um, you know, car commercials, uh, like Kool-Aid. What the? Come on! I mean, these are kids' things, and they're they're rap is this supposed to be this bad met like this bad bad boy kind of uh, uh, music from the from the s suburbs, you know, from the urban uh, uh, part of uh, our society and culture, and then they incorporate it into like children's uh, viewing television. I don't get it. It's it's just. It's just not right anymore. It, I, rap has lost all its uh, its meaning, as far as I'm concerned. You know, I could appreciate what it was years and years ago, and it it, uh, it provided a a message from the black community. But now I don't think it uh, it it does nothing for me. I really don't even care about rap. And as far as MTV is concerned, I think MTV is just primarily concerned about making money, which you know is pretty obvious. Everybody wants to make money, but when it comes down to it, MTV. They'll never play my video. Tell me that you hate rap. <laughs> <laughs> See, I hate rap. I I think I do hate rap. I hate rap. Yeah, I really do hate rap. It's one of the few music uh, genres that I don't enjoy at all. And I, the reason behind that is because I think because I maybe I didn't grow up Knowing, I mean, I, I I wasn't a rich kid, I wasn't a poor kid, but I wasn't a rich kid. So when I grew up in high school, like gr high school grammar school, rap wasn't even around. Disco was around. Okay, I'm showing my age now, but uh, then eventually, by like my late senior year, and then like all through um, my late teens, uh, you know, rap was very popular, and. I, the reason I think I never got into it was because I always I was always obviously into rock music, um, and I always appreciated music created it's for itself, not a drum machine or a beatbox um, with uh, lyrics put over. And it's not even the lyrics ninety time ninety percent of the times not even sung. It's just like worded over the, the music. Um, and maybe they might put a track of like piano or something or uh, it, it, it it's not much music to me it really isn't it cracks me up actually so I hate rap I fucking hate rap <laughs> <laughs> so when do you think that our type of music will uh, reemerge as on top well when you say our type of music what type of music I, are you generally I, what kind of uh, music do you uh, classify Empire Hideous as a lot of people have given different uh, descriptions of it. Some people have said it's punk. Some people have said it's metal. Some people have said it's goth. Some people have said it's gothic. I don't necessarily know. I mean, maybe it fits into all those genres. But to me, Empire Hideous is just rock music um, with a dark edge to it. It's not goth. It's not gothic. 
it's not metal, it's not punk, it's not hardcore. Although I think a lot of the, the those types of music um, are influence are influences to us uh, musicians in the band, like especially myself and Jeff, who is my guitar player. Um, him and I both grew up on the same types of music, uh, the Gun Club, TSOL, um, Fields of the Nephilim, the Chameleons UK, uh, the Mission UK, um, you know, things of, of that nature, the, the punk era, and, and a lot of the, the old school goth. Um, so, you know, we, we incorporate that type of influence into Empire Hideous. Uh, when him and I write music nowadays. I, I really don't know what to classify it as. I think there's a lot of people that in the metal scene or the goth scene that could appreciate Empire Hideous for what it is because we have guitars, because we have a live drummer, because there are, are vocals that are um, uh, lyrically composed to, to the music to, to be a song, to make it a song. So there's a lot of go that goes into a, 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 an Empire Hideous song. You know, I don't really write three-minute songs. I write, like, seven-minute, like, epics. Uh, you know, even longer than that, 10, 11 minutes of some, some songs that I've done in the past. But um, it, I think that's what attracts some of the, the people to our music is that we, we play our instruments. I think that's an important thing as a, as a musician in a band. Okay, goth and gothic, what is the hold difference? Hold on a second, hold on a second. What's that? Three. Huh. Take one. Uh, yeah, I've talked about this subject before. Goth and gothic. <sighs> well, years ago, I had done a, I had done an interview uh, for a film uh, called To Build an Empire, and we talked about um, the, uh, the the terminology goth and the terminology gothic, and whether or not Empire Hideous was goth or gothic, and. Uh, my answer still remains the same. If Empire Hideous has to have a classification between the two, I think uh, it would probably fall more in the gothic rock realm than it would for goth. Um, I think goth was a term that, this is just, again, this is just my opinion, I think goth was a term that came out uh, in the early 90s uh, of bands, uh, primarily American bands, um, that were really going for the quote-unquote goth look, goth sound, and the goth fashion, um, which is something I, I, I had explored, but I really never got into it, and I, and I realized after a while how Empire Hideous was more gothic rock than, than goth. Uh, goth, I think a lot of bands that fall into the goth category are bands that use a drum machine, uh, bands that use a lot of pre-programmed uh, keyboards and, and um, things of that nature. Um, but I don't think Empire Hideous falls into that goth terminology. Dual shot of <coughs> in the book, so we can. To me, that'd be great because I frame I frame everything. I'm a uh, K E I T H K E I T H, um, and last name is Kelly K E L L Y. Huh? K E L. My last name is Kelly K E L L Y. Real last name too. Well, you don't have to if you don't want. To. I'm just saying. Too much to remember. That's fine. <laughs> On the way here, we were wondering how you got your voice to sound like you were in a tunnel. On the uh, <laughs> lots of reverb. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<clears throat> you got it, man. Thank you. My pleasure. Hey, uh, Mr. Keith, you just had your record signed by... I'm going to Disney World! <laughs> Are you happy now? Okay. What are we doing? Uh, just go over your uh, your book. Okay. Um, you can start with um, you know, the making of it, whatever. You know. Okay. Um, after I got out of the out of the Misfits um, in '98, I started writing a book. Um, in September of 98 and uh, <clears throat> basically what I, I decided I I felt I had enough information uh, from going on tour and running my own band for 10 years that um, I had enough information that I could write something that would be interesting to people uh, such as myself um, who are in the music industry and on their way traveling you know the, the path to uh, their own success and um, I started writing in '98, and it took me took me about two years, technically, to to finish it. Um, now let me let me scratch that. It, it actually took me a year. I gave myself a year to write the whole thing, um, and in one year I completed it. Even though I had completed it, though, uh, once it was edited, I rewrote it a, a numerous amount of times. Um, I think there was about ten rewrites to the entire book. Um, uh, so then that was another year of rewrites. Uh, finally, by the end of the second year into the third year, it was pretty much done. And um, it, uh, it finally got out in the third year. The contents of the book, uh, what it's all about is, um, it's basically my view on, um, on the music industry as an independent musician. Uh, from start, <clears throat> from the start of my career uh, with Empire Hideous, through uh, the success with with um, the Misfits, out of that, and then back to square one again. So it's basically a rags to riches to rags story, um, and explaining how I went from uh, you know nothing, not knowing how to write music, not knowing how to do anything with music, play an instrument, um, book a show or anything, to playing to, you know, 13,000 people in Sweden, to coming back out of that and not having a job, not having uh, a place to live, um, not having a band, not having anything that would really, um, you know, not, not having a, a life that was prior to the misfits uh, for me I was basically uh, I was basically uh, I had nothing and uh, like I said rags to riches to rags again and I started all over and um, I'm still doing it you know I started Empire hideous again and uh, the book the book touches a lot about Empire hideous in the first I, I think the first six chapters. <coughs> and um, you know, there's three chapters dedicated. Uh, after that, there's three chapters dedicated to the, my involvement with the Misfits, and um, a chapter after that which uh, describes my uh, my aftermath of of the Misfits and then starting over again. Uh, I find it to be uh, uh, I I find it to be a, something I'm very proud of right now. Uh, it took me as long as it did, you know. All the information came from most of it, not all of it, but m most of the information came from the journals that I've kept since I was 18. Um, so the information, the, the everything that's logged in here, dates, locations, names, um, and they're all accurate because they're all taken from my journals. Um, there's photographs, there's over 40 pictures in here. Um, and it's finally, oh man, <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> Where was I? Oh yeah, okay. Want a brownie? Yeah. <laughs> a minute, hang on. 
All right. Focus. <laughs> Focus, Grasshopper. The book. <laughs> the book. What did I say? What was I saying? You were talking about being hungry. Clutch, yes. Cut, cut. There's over 40 pictures in the book. Uh, it touches on every angle of my life as a musician uh, and everything that went, uh, everything I went through from the beginning of Empire Hideous up until today. And um, it's something, like I said, it's something I'm very proud of right now. And I'm really, I'm really excited. I just, I, I just hope everybody else will, will enjoy it. I think um, uh, a few, the few people that have, that have spoken to me about reading it say that. It's a good read. Um, they find it to be an easy read, um, where uh, things that are described, it's 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 easy to understand. It's not a complicated book. Um, I don't find myself to be a, an intricate author, uh, an intricate writer. Uh, my experience in writing came from um, being interviewed as you know as, as a singer for the Empire Idiots, and also from uh, writing for uh, a music newspaper in Jersey that um, I used to have my own column for so I got my experience for like six years in writing never went to college or anything like that in fact I even failed English in high school so uh, I think it's an easy read I really do and I think that the people that have um, have cr uh, read it and reviewed it um, have have said what I would say about it, it being um, a book that you can uh, just pick up and read from cover to cover in, you know, a few days. I, I know somebody who, I know two people who read it in one day, and, uh, I don't know, it took me a couple of months. <laughs> Um, my book, titled King of an Empire to the Shoes of a Misfit, uh, The Memoirs of Mike Hideous, is available through firstbooks.com, and that's the number one, stbooks.com, and, um, or you could simply go to the, uh, the Empire Hideous website, which is empirehideous.com, and on the first page there is a link directly for it, um, and uh, you just click on that, type in the title, my name, and uh, you'll you'll get, you know, it'll put you right there. So it's um, soft covers like 1950, and hard covers 2750. And uh, right now it's only available through the internet because um, it's not a, it's it, what we're doing instead instead of taking a big chance and printing 10,000 books, it's a uh, it's an it's a book, you know. You get it print by order. In other words, if they order it, it's printed out directly from the computer, and then they this is what you get, um, as opposed to printing ten thousand of these, and if they didn't sell, I'd lose money. The company would lose money, and I wouldn't be making any more books. <coughs> oh, wait a minute. You want me to just go into talking about the misfits? Coming out of Empire Hideous um, and joining the Misfits was a well, it was a big, big step. You know, Empire Hideous. Well, we were used to playing gigs to anywhere between like three hundred and like a thousand people per show, uh, depending on the show and the location. So here I am. You know, I go from knowing that you know when I'm playing Empire Hideous shows knowing that we're always going to have our, our dedicated crowd there, you know, at least two, three hundred people, whatever. And then all of a sudden, I'm, now I'm getting into a band that I know is legendary. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm going to be playing festivals and arenas and, you know, clubs, huge clubs. It was a, it was a major, major step up for me. I mean, the one thing that I found that I patted myself on the back for was that I never really lost my cool um, in front of the audience. Uh, I never got nervous or anything like that. And um, I, I felt 
really good about that. I think that came from inside as a performer, knowing that I was still able to go out and entertain, you know, 10,000 people at a time. Um, so, yeah, it was a major step. It was a big, big deal for me. Uh, yeah, I think the first two, three shows, I was a little nervous uh, because it was my first time, you know, remembering the lyrics and all that sort of thing. But after that, it just became, it, it started to become second nature. Um, my my performance abilities as a, as a singer and a, an entertainer came out and just took over. And um, I think I gave them everything that I could possibly have given them, and more so. So, uh, yeah. Well, um, the real positive thing about playing with the Misfits for me was, as I said before, it was playing in front of a large group of people. However, there was a turn at one point where um, I felt that um, things had changed. I felt I felt like I was the lowest on the to uh, on the totem pole uh, as far as rank was concerned. And uh, in the the book describes my experiences and my emotion levels and how they were going up and down due to the fact on how I felt I was treated uh, by the band members. Uh, things just changed after a couple of weeks just being with them and living on, on a tour bus with them for, <coughs> for about 40 days. And it did change dramatically and affected me emotionally and mentally. Um, I was very unstable after a while because I really didn't have anybody to talk to. Everybody was all somebody knew that I had met. And, um, you know, without going into too much detail and, you know, taking away from the book, uh, it was very difficult. And then the breakup, eventually when the breakup occurred, I was devastated. Uh, I felt that I had, uh, I felt that I had gone through something that changed my life and then at the same time, uh, once um, they, f you know, they had their their fill of me, and they were done using me, they just let me loose. You know, they cut me loose, and that hurt a lot. It was really, really devastating. It affected me. I can't even begin to tell you how it affected me. It was. It just really affected me bad, very badly. And then again, the book really, it, the book goes into more detail about how and why and where and what. And um, uh, I think uh, if it wasn't for the the writing of the journals in my book, that uh, I would probably have gone insane. It really, really helped me a lot writing the, the journal uh, kept kept me sane I kept I would write things down and how I felt at the moment uh, while on tour and, you know something upset me and eventually going back and reading that and then writing it to, to the book really made me see that it was definitely a, a good outlet I was heartbroken and, and this fits asked me to leave. Yeah. Here he comes. Anytime you're ready. Um, recently we just signed up with a small label in New York called Middle Pillar Records. Um, Middle Pillar Presents actually. Um, and they are going to be financing our next uh, CD, and we're going to be on their label. Um, uh, we've signed a three-year, two-album contract with them, and uh, the first album we're currently recording right now is going to be all new material, and it's going to be entitled Say Your Prayers. 
Um, I think it's going to have about maybe seven, seven or eight tracks on it. But since our tracks are really long, that is a full length LP. Um, and, you know, I'm still trying to re-release, like, the, the album, like, the first 12-inch, um, uh, the cassette, This Evil on Earth, and the first CD, Only Time Will Tell, I'd like to re-release them on CD, remixed and remastered. Um, but I haven't really had the opportunity just yet. There's been lots of talk about doing it. And there's so much stuff that I have that's unreleased uh, that I'd like to release someday. But uh, right now, the main focus I have is getting out this new record. Say your prayers. Uh, some of the people that I'm, I'm working with now... Um, Jeff Austin uh, is the guitar player for Empire Hideous. He, uh, him and I have been working together for quite a few years now. He, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> that's the Rottweiler, up, Rottweiler upstairs. Let's try this again. Um, some of the people that I'm working with right now, um, on the recording is uh, Jeff Austin, who is the guitar player for Empire Hideous, the lead guitarist. Uh, Jeff and I have been together for, well, he, he got into the band in 98, and since then, like, he when he stepped, when the band broke up in 98, he didn't come back when we restarted it um, until just about, I guess about a year and a half ago. Uh, he came back. Finally, I begged him. I begged him. I said, "Look, you got to come back." I said, "It's just not the same without you." And he he gives Empire Hideous that uh, definitive sound that we've had for years that you know he has. And um, you know, Jeff's a great guy. You know, I love him. I think he's a, a fantastic musician. For the first time, we've actually started really, really concentrating on writing songs together. And uh, it's really, um, he's written a great song called Two Minutes to Midnight, which um, we're going to be making a video for. And uh, him and I both, uh, he wrote the music, I wrote the lyrics, and he's just, he's a great writer. Uh, then we also have Byron Barberi, who's a drummer. Byron uh, was in Spy Society 99 with me. And I asked him to play drums for Empire Hideous and... Uh, and uh, he's been with me since 99 as well. 98, actually. No, wait. 98? <laughs> About 98 into 99. We started together in 98. Um, yeah, he's a great drummer. And uh, the weird thing, though, is we think for this recording that's coming out, I don't think we're going to be using a live drummer. I think we're going to be using uh, uh, program drums. Just easier to work with right now. So, and uh, the guitar player that I have that's leaving right now is uh, Jason Trioxin. He's from a band called Mr. Monster. And uh, he also played in Spy Society. Um, Jason's got his own band, Mr. Monster. And, uh, he's he's going to be leaving Empire Hideous because he's moving to California. So by the time this is aired uh, or whatever, it, he'll, he will have already been gone. He's going to be actually leaving in a couple months. And uh, I've had so many different musicians in this band, it's not even funny. Again, another subject in the book. Um, I've had too many, too many musicians to even keep track of anymore. It's, it's crazy. My life growing up as Mike uh, Mel's own. Yeah. But I'd rather not put that on That's there. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> it's not going on there. Uh, it's on here though. <laughs> it's his own. Is it's it? On there. It's not my real name. I met somebody on online. With, uh, Everybody thinks that's my real name. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I have a couple more questions. We'll, we'll do the high school thing, and I have a couple of questions. And now we'll, 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 cut, we'll cut the video and we'll call it a day. What, what do you want to know about high school? What was it like growing up? Yeah, what, what was it like growing up? Um, were you different than everybody else? Yeah. Type of things like that. I mean, I mean, I know I was. I mean, yeah. Yep. Fucking, I used to sit. When I was in third grade, I remember third grade, I, I had the teacher move my desk to the fucking out of the way. I, mean, I didn't want to deal with anybody. <laughs> All right, um.
Anytime. Uh, this is an interesting subject, what it was like for me in high school, um, and even grammar school, if I can go back even further. I, in grammar school, and as a child, growing up for me, uh, you know, every kid searches for what they are, what what they're about, and what they want their, what they want to be. Um, I, as a child, uh, through the years of kindergarten up till like eighth grade, um, I lived the life. I was a mama's boy. I think I was the daughter my mother never had. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I grew up, I was Catholic, uh, with an Italian upbringing, Italian, German, and, and, and Dutch, and um, I led a very normal life through grammar school, you know, the friends, uh, the playing, having a good time, you know. Um, eventually I went to high school first two years of my uh, freshman high freshman and sophomore year high school uh, the first two years were very difficult I went to a from a public school to a Catholic school and um, I didn't like it one bit all my other friends went to a public school the popular public school in, in Passaic County in New Jersey and I got shipped off to uh, Catholic school um, which is why I am the way I am today, uh, because of my Catholic upbringing. Uh, and then I got kicked out of high school, and I went to another school. Um, and I started to be myself a little bit more. My mother bought me my first black leather motorcycle jacket, and I was walking around, you know, walking around the hallways, like, you know, starting trouble with guys that were like six feet tall on the basketball team just going, yeah, hey, man, you're crazy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I was invincible at that point. Um, I really, I mean, I, I started, and then I, I got a little bit into music back then. The, the thing for me, I was getting into, uh, like, in freshman and sophomore year, I went from, like, uh, let's say freshman year, what was I into? You know, like, heavy metal, ACDC, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, uh, you know, bands like that nature, the metal stuff, the Kiss stuff, and even though I was also influenced by Bowie uh, uh, and stuff. By sophomore year, I was listening to New Wave, uh, like The Fix, Joe Jackson, Psychedelic Furs, the B-52s, The Waitresses. I was getting more into that, like, you know, almost borderline punk rock, uh, but at the time, very New Wave. Um, and then all of a sudden, by when I got kicked out of PC and, and went to... Uh, Kennedy High School, um, I discovered punk rock, the Dead Kennedys, Black Flag, the Misfits, um, you know, and I started getting into punk rock. By senior year, I was getting into hardcore punk rock, like the FU's, Minor Threat, um, who else, Aggression, and uh, other silly bands like that. Uh, Gang Green, and um, it was funny because I was in high school when I I took that route, you know, spiked my hair short, started wearing like, uh, you know, clothes that definitely made me stand out as a as a young kid, young teenager in high school. All my friends uh, in this in this school were all into heavy metal and black metal, which was really kicking off back then, like Anthrax and. Uh, Slayer and Metallica, which one, you know, at that time they were good. Um, but uh, eventually, like, they all would, they would make fun of me for listening to bands like Suicidal Tendencies and Black Flag and The Misfits. And then, you know what? Three years later, they were all listening to it. And all of a sudden, the whole metal crossover hardcore thing changed and suddenly I was sitting back and saying you guys are jerks you know you all sat there and made fun of me and now you're all listening to what I listened to three four years ago and uh, needless to say uh, I, I progressed 
and I started then, you know, I was more into the horror rock, like the Misfits, TSOL, the Cramps, Alien Sex Fiend, um, and all of a sudden I, I said, you know what, I, I needed a new outlook on things, and um, I started to listening to Sisters of Mercy, and The Cure, and The Cult, and Fields of the Nephilim. And I was suddenly uh, attracted to the entire gothic rock scene. Um, and before you know it, I was ready to be in a band. You know, I wanted to move from my artistic background as, a, as, a, as an artist, as a painter, and a drawing, uh, a drawer, uh, to uh, a much more louder, expressive uh, way of, of uh, expressing yourself, should I say. Um, and uh, I eventually just bought a microphone. And a, some speakers and a guitar, my first guitar, and uh, I took music to a new level for myself. And I think I, I, from just from those few, just from that time of getting into rock and roll and music and the alternative side of rock and roll, I think I definitely made it a name for myself. Um, you know, I've been interviewed, uh, I've been in books, I've written books, I've made CDs, videos. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, I've become immortal. And what it takes to be immortal is a lot of hard work. And I spent 10 years of hard work in, in music, getting myself to the level that I'm at now. Which, uh, still, I'm not making as much money as Kid Rock or Eminem, but... Uh, you know what? Really, it doesn't mean anything. It's, it doesn't mean anything about money. It's that's not what it's about. It's about being true to yourself and others as well. And uh, I, I came a long way from high school until now. I look back, and you know, my life as a child and a young teenager. I think every kid goes through it. They try to find their identity, their characteristics. Uh, their personal characteristics about themselves and I found it I've stayed with it for what has to be 15 years now I've really I know who I am I know exactly who I am and what I'm all about that's Glenn and Erie <laughs> yeah my god Danceteria like their fourth concert that's, a, that's an authentic picture oh yeah sweet these are some pieces that I did. Uh, is that a death's head wall? Yes, it is. I, I have one of them. An eye for an eye! <laughs> I've seen the, uh, I was too late to, to get them when they, when they were at the Spy Society toys. No, these are your own works of art. Yeah, I, this is the first piece I did. Are these using Second. real? Yeah, these are human bones, human ribs, human finger bone, human ribs, uh, cow's teeth, a pigeon skull, a squirrel skull. Human teeth, my teeth, <laughs> my blood, um, a cat's jawbone, uh, a monkey's paw. Uh, these are cicadas. Mm -hmm. That's a dragonfly from California. That's a hornet. That's a bird I found dangling outside my neighbor's window upstairs on the third floor. And uh, it's, it hung out there for like a year. I, it's a funny story about that. <laughs> I, I'm walking out one day and I, um, I, I looked up and I saw this bird dangling by its foot, dead, over my neighbor's, uh, my second, third floor neighbor's uh, window. So I told him, I said, um, you have a bird hanging out, you know, dead from its foot on above your window. And I said, uh, you know, let's try to get it down. We couldn't reach it because it was just too far to drop to, to get to it. A month, not even a month, a, a week or two went by another bird was hanging. Two of them were hanging side by side by their feet. It's like they committed suicide. <laughs> and uh, eventually what I did is uh, a whole year went by and then eventually one of them fell. And when it fell, I cut the wings off. And I did this piece, um, which has uh, the wings and a foot. And right on the light bulb on the, on the top is the head of the dragonfly that's in this picture up here. Very creative. <laughs> so, 
Oh, this is a cast of my mouth. I was going to ask that. Is that your own? Yeah. What cast? is the cicada husk coming out of it? <laughs> I mean, you never find cicadas anymore. I, I used to be able to collect them all the time. And oh, they're around. I can't ever find them anymore. I, I, I used I, to collect on um, moths. I used to have a big collection of moths. Really? Yeah. And bird's nests and bird Death eggs. Death head moths are really I cool. I have one looking. of them, they're and awesome. I have a huge moth. You saw that, Chris. It was like. Yeah. Five inches span. It was yeah, just I, beautiful. I found it and it was still alive, and I kept it, and it died, and I still have it. <laughs> really? Yeah. You ever want to get rid of it? Oh, really? You know you where to it? give it to. <laughs> How did you acquire human ribs? Um, like, how does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a friend in the business. Uh, I had um, I'm not going to mention his her name, uh, but I had a friend who worked in a morgue. And would uh, get me various, uh, various pieces of anatomy. Um, I have everything from human feet, human hands, uh, human ribs, human toes, fingers, uh, slice of human brain. I have fetuses in jars. I have, lot, I have a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. My Leg works. bones, arm bones. We gotta go there one day. Here, it's not complete yet. Well, you want we want to stand in front of that section? I'll, I'll stand like like here. All right, let's angle these. Is legs it too more. high though? Like you want me down? Like you know, like here or something? It, it'll actually make the thing look like it's gigantic. Yeah, if you oh, sit. Oh, Do you want to? Can you bring? Try not to. I got my lid on now, so all I did was my head. For some reason, I think. All right. All right. Um. How the fuck do we want to plug this now? The, the video, or the yeah, the music video. Um, you can't stand back there, can you? What is it holding up? What's holding it up? Uh, we'll whenever you're ready, just uh, say this is this is the video for two uh two minutes to midnight. Um, the song is about so and so, and then that's it. This is uh, the video for a song called uh, Two Minutes Till Midnight, written by myself and Jeff Austin. Um, it's uh, the, the uh, meaning of, uh, of this uh, particular song um, is like a lot of songs that I've written. Um, it's about the, uh, the coming of the apocalypse. A little bit more meaning here and there, but for the most part, coming the coming of the apocalypse. Label's off. Yeah, well, I save a lot of my, uh, my uh, canisters so I can put things in them. Go ahead. This video is uh, for the song titled Two Minutes Till Midnight. It's on our forthcoming record called Say Your Prayers. Awesome. I'm Mike Hideous. I'm from a band called The Empire Hideous. Uh, I started Empire Hideous back in 1988. Um, uh, just basically, I had no idea what I was doing. I started writing music uh, with a friend of mine, and eventually, before I knew it, the band picked up, and we were doing club shows and recording records and CDs and tapes and doing videos and all that. Empire Hideous has been, it's, it's been quoted as being um, an apocalyptic band. Uh, the music that I've written about over the years and the lyrics that I write always have to do with the end of the world or the coming of the end of the world or Nostradamus' predictions and prophecies. The song logical is actually a song written about drugs. Um, some people, yeah, yeah, a lot of people didn't really know that. Uh, some people think it's a political thing, but it's actually, it's, um, it's about drugs. It's about um, experimenting with drugs and the effects that they, they can have on you. And this is called Logic. Show. 